to get started. Okay, can you see the slides? Okay, so it's hard to believe, but it's the last class of this semester. So we started talking about the sort of the, in some sense, finale of this course, quantum electrodynamics for the Feynman diagrams. And people call this QED for a reason. This theory is so successful. I'm gonna come back and talk about this later, that uh, this is meant to be almost the end of the proof that the quantum field theory works. So hence QED. So uh, it's, in a, it's really incredible theory. So we talked about how to compute the matrix elements using time dependent perturbation theory. But the main message was that once you use this language of the Feynman diagrams and the Feynman amplitudes, you don't need to remember much of the intermediate steps we had to go through over the semester. So you can forget about the fact that we're using time dependent perturbation theory. Everything is time ordered. Everything is made up of uh, creation addition operators and all that stuff. So you just go ahead and, and draw diagram and each element of the diagram translates into a mathematical expression and you glue them together to obtain the matrix element of a scattering process. So you already know how to do that. So the rest of the step, when you actually try to compare what you compute with the Feynman diagrams to something you can observe in experiments, is that you can actually now uh, translate that into an observable, namely cross-section. So when you send in set of particles, they scatter, and that defines some kind of effective area of this target we are, you are actually scattering against. And so that is the, the meaning of the cross-section. We already look at the cross-section in the case of the um, photon getting scattered from the atom, the Rayleigh scattering. That's when we talked about the fact that the sky looks blue because of that. So we now generalize this to a relativistic quantum field theory. And when you do this, if you remember what you have done back in the Rayleigh scattering discussions, we, had, we actually used the box normalization for particles. So you set up a box of size L and within a cube, you put in one particle and you send in another particle with a velocity V. That's how we define the flux factor to compute the cross section. Now that we are not using box normalization to make sure that everything is Lorentz invariant, we have to be a little bit more careful about what we mean by the flux factor. And in particular, we're using this delta function normalization for particles. That creation annihilation operator has a commutator that is proportional to not only two pi h bar cubed times delta function, but there's another factor of two e on top of it. So what it means is that if you remember the discussions we, which we did long time ago, when we actually uh, rewrote two pi h bar times delta function energy in terms of time interval, when we, we uh, derived the uh, the Fermi's golden rule, the idea was that two pi h bar times delta function is just the integral over space or time of e to the ipx and stuff like this. So when the delta function is satisfied, then e to the ipx is one. So this integral turns into the length or time duration. If you have three dimensional volume for this, then this delta function basically translates the volume of space. So when you have the normalization we have, for the creation addition operator, where the creation addition commutator is this delta function times 2e. That's the normalization we used because we want to use this Lorentz invariant phase space factor where you have 2e downstairs. Then what it means is that you basically have 2e particles per volume. So it's a weird normalization, but that's the non only normalization that makes sense from the point of view of relativity. If you do a Lorentz boost, <clears throat> energy increases by a gamma factor, but the volume decreases by Lorentz contraction by one over gamma. So this idea actually remains constant. <clears throat> so that's why this is the right normalization we use for Lorentz invariant relativistic quantum field theory. So we need to pay attention to the fact that there is one particle, <clears throat> not sorry, two E particles per unit volume. So when you define the flux factor, you have to take care of it. So imagine you are doing a what is called a fixed target experiment. Namely, you accelerate a particle and you smash at a target that is at rest. A particle that is at rest has the rest energy mc squared, and that's the energy of the particle at rest. 
So using this idea that there's two E particles per volume, then the density is two E per volume. So inverse of that density is one over two M. So I'm leaving out C squared now because we're using natural unit. So it's one over two MC squared is something that comes into the, as a inverse density of the particle. In the same way, the particle you are sending in, that's the density of one over two E because of the reason we just talked about. And this particle is coming with the speed V2. So the flux factor you use to compute the cross section would be the product of both, namely one over two M1, one over two E2 and V2. But so far, this is specific to the rest frame of particle one. So we need to now generalize this to an arbitrary reference frame where you, you might do experiments, especially that many of the modern experiments have been done with the colliding facility, namely that you send any particle from one side, you send another particle from the other side, they collide in the middle in the center of momentum frame. So this expression is good if one of the particles is at rest, but when both of them are moving, this is not the right expression to use. So that's why we have to generalize this to a reference frame independent expression. So what we are supposed to do is, is fairly obvious. So the density of the particle, which is the target now, used to be at rest, and that's why energy was M1, but now it may be moving, so it goes with two E1 instead. So instead of one over two M1, I write one over two E1, that's already a generalization to arbitrary reference frame. And in this new reference frame, again, we have the density that's given by the energy of the second particle. So this E2 is different from the original E2 because we're now looking at a different reference frame, but nonetheless, in the new frame, it has to be again, one over two E2. And what's tricky is what replaces this velocity. So in the case of the rest frame of the particle one, the velocity of particle two was indeed the velocity we want to use because the velocity of particle two is the relative velocity between two particles, namely V2 minus zero is the relative velocity. But when both particles are moving, then relative velocity of course has contribution from each of these particles. So particle one is moving at a speed of P1 dot E1 or beta one, if you like, in a unit where C is one. Then particle two is moving with a speed P2 over E1. And if you're thinking about head on collision, then the relative velocity between the two is some of these two velocities. And so this is the expression for the relative velocity. And of course, we like to also write it in a manifest in Lorentz invariant fashion by computing the momenta of particle one and particle two in the center of momentum frame where total momentum vanishes, they cancel against each other. So as a function of total energy in the center of momentum frame, you can write momentum of each particle using the expression I call beta bar, which looks kind of complicated, but when you actually specialize this to the case when two particle masses are the same, then the third term in the square root vanishes. Second term becomes four M squared over S. S by definition is a center of momentum energy squared. So each particle has energy half of this. Then this expression reduces to one minus M squared over energy squared for individual particles. And that's the expression we have seen before for particle of mass M with energy E, this is the velocity over C. So this expression is actually a familiar expression when two particles that are colliding against each other are of the same species and have the same mass, or even when particle is particle, the other one is antiparticle because they do have the same mass as well. So in that case, this expression just reduces to the ordinary velocity. But if two particles have different masses, then you really have to use this expression to keep track of the mass differences between the two. And so this beta again has the meaning of the relative velocity over two in a center momentum frame. So the flux factor you use in the end is this one over here, one over two. And this little s is the center momentum energy squared. 
and beta bar in this expression. And this S is one of the variables called the Mandelstam variables, uh, according to Stanley Mandelstam, who used to be in a department who unfortunately passed away several years ago, but he really invented the techniques in dealing with all these relativistic collisions. And S is one of such kinematic variables that he introduced. So this is called the Mandelstam's S, which simply means center of momentum energy squared in the particle collisions. Okay, so anyway, so this is the idea how you can use the amplitude we worked on using Feynman diagrams, you basically stick that amplitude inside this phase space integral and then divide it by this flux factor to compute the cross section. Okay, so I hope the idea of the flux factor uh, actually uh, is, is, it makes sense using this relative velocity between two particles. But if there are any questions, please ask now. Oh, um... okay, Riley. So this new flux factor is now mm -hmm. Lorentz invariant quantity? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So everything is written in terms of P1 plus P2 squared. And square is a contraction between upper and lower indices. So S is an Lorentz invariant kinematic variable. And if you go to center of momentum frame, then S has the meaning of total energy squared in that reference frame. And using this Lorentz invariant quantity Mandelstam's S, Beta bar is written as a function of mass, which is Lorentz scalar. That you know, mass doesn't change no matter what reference frame you are in, specific to a given particle species. And S, as I said, is also Lorentz invariant. So beta bar is also written in a Lorentz invariant fashion. So this expression for the flux factor, one of our two S beta bar, is the same in any reference frame you like, and hence has the Lorentz invariant meaning. Thanks for asking that question, Riley. Any other questions? Um, sorry if you already said this and I missed it, but in the relative velocity, why is it not um, P2 over E2? Sorry, this is a typo. Thank you, Natalie. So this is meant to be P2 oh. over E2. So P1 over E1 is the velocity of the first particle. P2 over E2 is the velocity of the second particle because they're head-on collision relative velocity is a sum of absolute value of two velocities. So this was really meant to be E2. So thank you for pointing that out. I'm gonna actually make the corrections later on and we post the slides on, on the courses. Thank you, Natalie. Any other questions? You know, this class has been excellent pointing out all the typos I had on slides so I can correct all of them. Good, so now that we know the flux factor, we write down the full expression for the cross section. Yeah, I forgot to mention that this is not the normalization for the canonical commutation relation for bosons and canonical anti-commutation relations for fermions. So we got these factors. So this is the Lorentz invariant phase space. We talked about that before. We now have the flux factor and the matrix element always comes together with this four dimensional delta function for energy momentum conservation. And this curly A, is what stands for what you compute with the Feynman diagrams, which we did on Wednesday for various examples. So now you have all the elements we can use to compute the cross section. So you integrate over the phase space for the final state particles. So here I'm imagining that I'm looking at a two to two collisions, two particles come in, two particles come out. And for two particles in the final state, I need to sum over all possible states using this Lorentz invariant phase spaces for particle one, dq pf1 over two pi cubed two ef1. Again, I'm ignoring h bar by setting it to one. And same deal for the second particle. I sum over all final states for the second particle by integrating over possible momenta for the second particle pf2, two pi cubed two ef2. Then you square the amplitude a, so absolute square of the amplitude comes in. And you have this uh, four dimensional uh, delta function. And when you actually square the, uh, the, uh, uh, the amplitude to compute the probability, just like in the case of time independent perturbation theory, you square the delta function and one delta function turns into time interval, but it's four dimensional, there's also a factor of volume and you divide both sides. And volume factor in the end gets absorbed into the flux factor and one over time, 
is basically divided by the flux, how many particles come in per unit time. So all these factors on volume and time are now taken into account by using the flux factor we just uh, looked at on the previous slide. And this is it. So once you have the Feynman diagram and compute the amplitude for the diagram, you stick that into curly A, take absolute squared. You have four dimensional delta function to conserve energy and momentum between initial state and final state. You sum over all possible final states using this Lorentz invariant phase basis, and then divided by the flux factor of two S beta bar, and that's it. Then comes out the cross section. And using this cross section, you can do the measurements in experiments and compare the rate of particles coming out per unit flux and compare that to the theoretical expression you have on this slide and to see if theory is working to explain the experimental data. So that's the idea. So now you have all elements in full glory. So whenever you have a Feynman diagram, what you have to do is to work out the Feynman diagram and work out the number for it, then you stick that into this expression and out comes the cross section, which you can compare to the experimental data. Okay, so let me pause here again to see if there are any questions. Everything okay? So I think I'm gonna actually ask you to do for the final is that now that you have been computing the matrix element for the Coulomb scattering off from the infinite heavy proton, but electron can still be relativistic, I'd like you to actually verify that that calculation reduces to the standard Rutherford scattering when electron is non-relativistic. But you can also see relativistic corrections because electron has a spin. Spin comes with a magnetic moment. And when the magnetic moment is moving in the presence of the Coulomb field, then the particle would see a magnetic field as a Lorentz transformation of the electric field. And the spin would sense that magnetic field due to the Coulomb field. And then that would lead to additional interaction, basically spin orbit coupling, that would actually give you a relativistic correction to the Rutherford scattering. So it would be actually fun to see that, namely that you reproduce the correct non-relativistic limit for the Coulomb scattering. But in addition to it, you can start to observe what relativity does on top of the non-relativistic limit. So you are going to use this formula for the cross section for the specific case of sending electron on top of an infinite heavy proton. And that will tell you what S is because this is basically the mass of the proton squared. That would also tell you what beta bar is. And then you stick that in here and do this four dimensional integral and out comes the cross section. So you will be doing that exercise on your own. And when you have any trouble performing this two body phase space integral, there's a lecture note on B courses named phasespace.pdf that tells you how you can solve for the delta function to conserve energy and momentum explicitly in various reference frames and then perform this uh, four dimension uh, uh, phase space integrals. And you have three dimensional phase space integral for the particle one, three dimensional phase space integral for the particle two, but you have four delta functions. So in the end, that reduces to only two dimensional integrals and two dimensional integrals in the center of momentum frame is very simple. It's just a solid angle integral. So when two particles come in head on, two particles get scattered in some off direction. The only way you can conserve total momentum and energy is that the particles fly out in whatever direction they may, they may into the four pi solid angle. And that's all remaining degrees of freedoms are. So this complicated looking six dimensional integral with a four dimensional delta function just reduces to a solid, inter in solid angle integral when you're dealing with this in the, um, uh, the center of momentum frame. And you see this factor called beta bar F, which is the same expression as beta bar I, except that now you have to stick in the final state particles three and four, whatever they may be. So if you send in two particles of one, two, they may come out to be particle three and four. So here I'm using one and two in this expression, but the final state particles may be totally different particles from what you have sent in, like the picture you have seen on Wednesday, you send in electron and positron, 
and out can come mu one and anti mu one. So in this case, final state particle have different mass from the initial state particle. So in that case, this phase space factor has this beta bar F where beta bar factor is computed now with the masses of the particles in the final state instead of the masses of particle in the initial state for beta bar I. So the notation I think is clear now, beta bar is referring to this expression given in terms of center of mass energy squared and the masses of the particle involved. And when I write beta bar I, I'm referring to masses of the two particles in the initial state. When I say beta bar F, I'm talking about the masses of the two particles in the final state, same mathematical expression, but different masses possibly in the uh, formula. So this complicated phase space integral just reduces to this solid angle integral to using this beta bar F factor. And for elastic scattering, the initial and final state particles are the same. So in that case, M1 and M3 are the same, M2 and M4 are the same. So beta bar F from the phase space integral and beta bar I in the flux factor cancel. So that's simply a very simple situation you can have. So in that case, the cross section reduces to something really, really simple. So one over two S is still there times eight pi coming from this phase space integral. Beta bar F cancels beta bar I in the flux factor. And you have solid angle integral of four pi and the Feynman amplitude squared you compute from the Feynman diagrams. For elastic scattering, cross section has this very, very simple expression in the end. So this is how you can perform the phase space integral for the simple kinematical situation of the center of momentum frame. And I'm not showing the algebra to derive this, it's just tedious. But again, if you look at this uh, notes, phase space.pdf, you can see every step of the calculation to arrive at this expression of beta bar f over eight pi times the uh, solid angle integral. And it also shows how to generalize this to three body phase space or any body phase space by combining two body phase space integrals many, many times over. Okay, so any questions about this slide? <clears throat> no questions? Oh, looks like Riley was just about to hit the button, but you were just getting a drink. Any, uh, anybody else? Okay, so this is just a formula you have to use when you compute the cross sections. So uh, for me, you know, I do cross section calculation all the time. So I have actually memorized this formula, but even if you don't memorize it, you can just always look it up and plug that into this expression for the cross section. So when you do the homework problem, you are always welcome to look up the slides or note uh, the, the uh, lecture notes and use those expressions in your calculation. So you don't need to derive these beta ball factors every time you look at some, some problem. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Actually, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my PhD thesis. So when I was a, a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, I wrote my thesis by developing a software that allows us to compute any Feynman diagrams you like without loops. I'm gonna mention that actually later on. And then you can do this for any renormalizable quantum field theory, including the standard model. So it was a very general package. I named that Hellas, Helicity Amplitude Subroutines for Feynman Diagram Evaluations. And later this program was incorporated into an automated program called MathGraph. So if you actually look up and Google for it, MathGraph is a program you can run on your computer. All you have to do is type in what initial state particles do you like, what final state you particles do you like, then it automatically generates all the Feynman diagrams you got within the standard model particle physics, and then starts go ahead and compute those Feynman diagrams and compute the cross section for those initial and final states. So somebody asked the question, how do you know which is the complete set of Feynman diagrams you're supposed to compute? This is at least one way. If you run this program, it generates a set of Feynman diagrams which you can print out into PDF and look at them so you know the complete set of Feynman diagrams for a given initial state and given final state. So you know what they are. And this program further goes ahead and try to even compute the cross-section for those processes. 
as long as they are simple enough and can be done on a simple computer. And so that's the program for MathGraph, which was originally based on the program I wrote for my PhD thesis. So this basically automates computation of any process in a standard model, at least at the lowest order of perturbation theory. And when you go to you know, actual real calculations for various collider experiments like LHC, not only that you talk about two to two process, but sometimes two to three process like this one, then you start seeing like eight Feynman diagrams. If you go to two to four process, you start to see something like a 30 Feynman diagram and so on. And if you go to more complicated process that involves particles like quarks and gluons, even at the lowest order in perturbation theory, you start seeing hundreds and thousands of Feynman diagrams. And MathGraph, based on my program headers, can still do it, but you can see that things get pretty complicated. That's why I had to develop a numerical package instead of an analytical package to compute them because algebraic manipulation turns out to be too cumbersome. But this is an area there's still a lot of progress going on in research on quantum field theory. And there are many techniques being uh, actually developed that even if you compute like a thousand Feynman diagrams, in some cases, all those thousand diagrams eventually simplify to a simple one single term in analytic expression. So that sounds you know, too good to be true, but it does happen in some cases. So people have now tried to systematize in what cases you have this drastic simplification of hundreds and thousands of diagrams into just a couple of terms you can write analytically. And there has been a lot of progress in this direction over the last decade or so. So there's still a lot of research going on in computing these Feynman diagrams. And there's a lot of progress still happening. There's still a lot of research to be done in this area as well. So the quantum field theory is still in the works. What I have told you so far is basically what have been known Waiting for many decades, but the quantum field theory is still evolving and moving forward. A lot of still being done, a lot of research to be done, many progress is still being done. So that's one area of the progress that is still happening, They're actually pretty fast these days, by right? combining analytical skills together with uh, much better computing power we have today compared to those days when I was a PhD student myself. One side story to this though, that I presented the software package and showed a bunch of calculations for the future collider processes called the International Linear Collider that is still being worked on. It hasn't materialized over two decades since my PhD, uh, but uh, we, I presented a bunch of simulation results for that for, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the collider experiment being planned right now. And at the end of the day, I nearly failed my thesis defense. So, you know, the experimentalist on the committee said, okay, he says he produced a bunch of data, but these are not experimental data. They are just simulations. And theorists on the committee said, well, you know, he says this is a theoretical physics, but this is just computer software. What's theory about it? And there was a very huge debate if this is worth PhD in physics. So normally when you'd go to a thesis defense, and fortunately Berkeley doesn't have thesis defense to avoid a big pressure and a drama, but University of Tokyo and many other universities do. So after thesis defense, you get grilled by a bunch of questions by the committee and you get kicked out of the room and the committee del deliberates for like five, 10 minutes. And you get invited back into the room and chair greets you, congratulations, you are now doctor. In my case, I was out of the room, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes. And somebody who was not the chair of the committee came out visibly panting, clearly after lots of debates, maybe even shouting match. And he said, you passed. So there's a fairly huge discussions going on if my PhD was worth PhD in physics. So things have changed since then. You know, these days computer software is much more appreciated because simulation became one indispensable tool in connecting theory to experiments there's a much higher appreciation on the work for the computer simulation software these days. But that was not true 30 years ago when I was graduating. So, you know, I'm proud to say that I was ahead of the times, but it was miserable. <laughs> so I was really shocked by that. So anyway, that's part of the reason I came to the United States. But anyway, so Feynman diagram calculation can be done this way. And back to this electron proton scattering we have been talking about on Wednesday. So now I hope you can see 
that the minute you say you're looking at the scattering process of electron and proton, you can probably immediately draw this Feynman diagram. Electron comes in, electron gets scattered in off direction, proton comes in, proton gets scattered in off direction. And that happens because you are exchanging a virtual photon. And I told you that this virtual photon is really the essence of what we used to call Coulomb interaction in classical electromagnetism or even quantum mechanics. So Coulomb interaction is due to an exchange of a virtual particle, in this case, a photon. So pretty much all the forces we talked about in physics these days are due to exchange of some particle. Weak interaction of the nuclear beta decay is due to the exchange of the particle called the W boson, which is very heavy, which costs a lot of energy. That's why it doesn't go very far. It's a short range force. The range is only like 10 to minus 16 centimeters because of that, which corresponds to the Compton wavelength of the W boson. But nonetheless, the weak interaction is caused by the exchange of this virtual W boson. Strong interaction that binds protons and neutrons inside the nucleus is caused by the exchange of particles called the pions. I did mention pions briefly in the context of cosmic ray physics and atmospheric neutrinos. So these are the strongly interacting particles and pion is exchanged between protons and neutrons. And that's how the protons and neutrons are bound together inside the nucleus, even though the two protons want to repel each other again by the exchange of the virtual photon in this case. So it's a competition between the exchange of virtual photon versus the exchange of the pions as a virtual particles. And that's how the nuclei actually bind together. And that's why you can have your body with a nucleus sitting at the rest uh, and very safely and this, without disintegrating. So we overlife the pions because of that. But nonetheless, this is also caused by the exchange of virtual particles. So once we have this Feynman diagram, you now know how to associate each element of the Feynman diagram to each piece in the Feynman amplitude. <coughs> so initial state electron comes together with the positive energy solution, U of PI. So that's over here in magenta. And following the arrows, next thing that comes here is this Feynman vertex minus IE gamma mu, if you say C and H bar to be one. And then comes the final state electron given by this positive energy solution, but this is the final state. So positive energy solution is now barred, the complex conjugated and gamma naught. So that's the piece you get by following the electron side of the lines. Again, you follow the arrows for the proton. Initial state proton has this positive energy solution U of pi. And following the arrows, you hit this vertex that's e to the plus IE gamma nu. This is plus because the proton charge is plus E instead of minus E. And then comes the final state proton, U bar, uh, final state proton momentum, capital BF. So this side is following the arrows with a proton. And in between, you switch it, uh, sandwich this photon propagator. This is the virtual photon going from either from electron to proton or proton to electron. So this propagator already sums over two different time orderings so this is already the sum of electron emitting photon absorbed by proton plus proton emitting a photon absorbed by the electron. So this minus Ig mu over Q squared already has a sum of two, those two time orderings. And once we have all these elements, then all you need to do for the rest is stick in the solutions you obtain from the Dirac equation, in this case, a positive energy solutions for helicity positive one half and helicity negative one half. And if you take the non-relativistic limit, this is what I will be asking you to do in the final exam, so pay attention to that. When it's non-relativistic, then energy of the electron is dominated by mc squared. So that actually really simplifies to square root 2m for the first two components times this two component spinner chi for a given helicity, and e minus mc squared you see the cancellation. So the lower two components just vanish. So this is a great simplification. So in this case, just like what you have shown for the proton side, when you assume the proton mass is infinitely heavy, 
that's when you could show, or maybe you're still working on a homework problem, that only the time component gamma matrix would give you non-zero contribution. In a similar way, if you take this non-relativist limit where electron comes in very slowly, nearly at rest, then again, only the time component contributes. And this is easy to work out because U bar is U dagger gamma naught. Gamma naught is the uh, Dirac's matrix beta he introduced. This is one minus one. The beta squared is unit matrix one, 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 one. So they basically cancel. What do you end up with is U dagger minus IE U. And U is given just by this chi two component spinner together with square root of 2m. I have square root of 2m for initial state u and also from final state u. So square root is now open to just 2m. And then the rest is just two component spinners, chi i and chi f. So depending on whether initial state particles spin up or spin down, this is 1, 0, 0, 1. Then you can see that basically the spin orientation of electron is conserved in the scattering process. So if electrons comes in spin up, then final state also goes out with spin up. If the initial state electron comes in spin down, final state electron goes down out with spin down. And that's what this product chi f dagger chi i is telling you. If initial state is one zero, there's no amplitude to get out with zero one because they all thrown at each other. Namely the spin direction is preserved in this non-relativistic limit. So now this completes the entire amplitude. So proton side, you're working on a homework problem, which turns out to be this IE to capital M, chi F dagger chi I for the proton spins. Now we compute the electron side of things, negative IE because of a negative charge to M for the electron mass. Again, chi F dagger chi I for the electron spin wave functions. Then you have the complete Feynman amplitude now. And you learn the spin is approximately conserved if the initial state and final states have the same spin, this matrix element is indeed one. On the other hand, if the final state electron and initial and final state particles have the opposite spins, then this is zero, so it doesn't contribute to the probability. And that's something you know from the quantum mechanics class. In non the quantum mechanics, spin is basically free. It can couple to magnetic field, but doesn't couple to electric field, namely Coulomb field. So spin doesn't get affected by the scattering by the Coulomb potential, so spin is conserved. So you have orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum conserved separately, and that's a situation you're familiar with in non the quantum mechanics, which of course does change once the electron becomes semi-relativistic and ultra-relativistic, we will talk about that uh, in the uh, other uh, 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 as we go on. But anyway, so this is the situation in the non relativistic uh, uh, scattering. When you go slightly away from the near rest, then electron momentum has a slight, uh, a little bit of a motion, mv. Then you have to recompute this matrix element using initial state and final state momenta. Then you can have the scattering angle theta and phi. So initial state comes along the z direction. Final state may not be along the z direction, but now into a different direction in the solid angle given by this spherical coordinate state in phi. Then momentum transfer is given by the difference between initial state momentum and final state momentum. Energy is still dominated by mc squared. So the difference is zero for the time component, but spatial components no longer vanishes. So you need to actually put that in all here. So this is Q mu for momentum of this virtual photon exchange between electron and proton. So the Q squared factor in the propagator is Lorentz invariant square of this. Namely, you take this Q mu with mu upstairs, you take Q mu with mu downstairs by flipping the signs of all the spatial components and you sum of the mu's between upstairs and, and downstairs indices. So that gives you this Q squared, which is negative 2m squared v squared times one minus cosine theta. And using the uh, trigonometric relationship, I can rewrite one minus cosine theta as twice sine squared theta over two. 
Then Q squared can be now written as negative four M squared V squared sine squared theta over two. And this expression I'm hoping starts looking familiar to you. When you look at the formula for the Rutherford scattering, this M squared V squared sine squared theta over two was downstairs in square. And that's because you have one over Q squared in this propagator. Q squared is given by this. You square the Feynman amplitude to compute the cross section. So this quantity, 4m squared v squared sine squared theta over two is downstairs and you square the whole thing. So that's why the Rutherford scattering comes with one over this combination squared. So I hope you this looks vaguely familiar. If you may not remember precisely how the Rutherford scattering formula looks like, but this is indeed in the Rutherford scattering formula downstairs squared from this expression. So that's how this Coulomb scattering, which we compute with the Feynman diagrams now in quantum electrodynamics. But if you go back to non relativistic limit from this relativistic quantum field theory, it reproduces what you have done in classical mechanics class and also in quantum mechanics class in getting the waterfall scattering formula. So that's the idea how this cross-section calculation works in the end. Now, any questions about this? How to take the non relativistic limit from this expression for the Feynman amplitude to something you can really compute in terms of these just numbers at the end of the day? Any questions? Um, I do have a question, it's more of a technical question. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. In you up above when you um, took the limit and you got mm -hmm. the square root of two n, mm -hmm. um, what is chi without the plus or minus? So chi, ah, sorry. So this is meant to be either chi plus or chi minus, depending on what spin set you're looking at. So I probably should have put down chi plus over here. Okay. So this is just a two component spinner now and the upper component corresponds to spin up, lower component corresponds to spin down. And if you're looking at the helicity eigenstate, of course, spin is a mixture of spin up and spin down so that it's pointing the direction of the momentum. So in this case, I started out the U plus with chi plus in here. So I should have written chi plus here to avoid confusion. So sorry about that. That's another thing I should correct and repost the slides on B courses later on. So once you have the chi plus over here, then when you compute this product, then you use whatever spin wave function you have, either spin up, spin down states or helicity eigenstates, whatever you like for the initial state. You do the same thing for the final state, again, spin up or spin down or helicity eigenstate. But in this case, the end result is just chi dagger chi. So it's a lot more simpler to think of spin up or spin down states because two spin up states are uh, 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 give you the probability one, two spin down states give you probability one, and spin up and spin down states orthogonal to each other. So chi i and chi f better be chosen as spin up and spin down states to get the simple expression for the amplitude. But if you would like to stick to the helicity eigenstates, chi plus or chi minus, which is like cosine theta over two, sine theta over two e to the i phi, then you can do that too. Then this chi f dagger chi i turns into things like a, uh, uh, a cosine theta or sine theta at the end of the day. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Um, sort of, now it's brought up more questions. So okay, good. before you take the limit, are they, um, are they helicity eigenstates or are they not? Yeah, so before taking the limit, I use this helicity plus eigen uh, 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 spinner. So this is the helicity eigenstate. But in this case, I'm talking about uh, the particle moving in Z direction. So helicity eigenstate is, is the same thing, a spin plus along the Z direction or spin minus along the Z direction. So SZ plus state and SZ minus state is indeed the helicity eigenstate for the initial state. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the final state, if you have this off uh, direction uh, given by theta and phi, then helicity eigenstate and spin eigenstates differ. So helicity eigenstates uses this quantization axis of spin along the direction of the momentum. 
Normally for the spin eigenstates, we talked about spin along the Z direction. So they are different by the rotation, the two by two rotation of the spin states. Okay. Okay, yeah. Thank Great. you. Thank you for asking the question, Natalie. Any other questions here? Um, in your two components of you, the okay. bottom one responds to antimatter, right? So would it be reasonable? No, no, this is still matter. Huh? The antimatter solution would be negative energy solutions. Negative energy solution actually has E minus MC squared for the first two components and E plus MC squared for the, um, the, the, the lower two components. So in the limit of the normal logistic limit, the lower two components correspond to negative energy solutions. But if you're not in that limit where particles are moving, positive energy solution has non-zero lower two components and negative energy solutions have non-zero upper two components. So both positive energy solution and negative energy solutions have all four components once the particle is moving. So what are you saying is right strictly when particle is basically at rest, in that case, positive energy state, uh, solutions have non-zero components only for the upper two, negative energy solutions have components only for the lower two, but once particle is moving, that's necessarily not true anymore. I see. Is that the question you're okay. asking? Exactly, yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, so I think conceptually everything is now straightforward. Once you have these solutions that direct equation, all you need to do is to stick them in to the expressions of the Feynman amplitudes and do this four by four algebra, and that's it. And if you are a lazy like I am, you can let Mathematica do this four by four algebra for yourself. So then you don't need to do any algebra on a piece of paper. So, you know, whatever you like, this is something very easy to compute, at least conceptually. It may be tedious sometimes, but conceptually just all straightforward now. Okay, and when you actually stick in these uh, expressions using this Q squared I computed for the virtual photon in the uh, previous slide, the Feynman amplitude is inverse of this Q squared. So if you put all the factors together with this two M here, two capital M here, and together with this little M squared V squared downstairs, that cancels one factor of little M. I end up with one factor of little M downstairs instead. And sine inverse is co co cosec, right? Cosecant. So, uh, so this is the expression for the amplitude now. Then you put that into the formula for the cross section. And this is the elastic scattering. So I don't need to worry about this beta bar F beta bar I, they cancel against each other. So I can use the simplified formula. And S center of mass energy is mass of the two particles squared because more, both of them are pretty much at rest. Energies are all dominated by MC squared for each particles. The mass of the proton of course dominates in this case. So I can ignore the mass of the electron. This gets just mass of the proton squared in the end. So I put this capital M squared into S and you have the solid angle integral. So this capital M squared partly cancel this capital M. And then I can derive this expression for the differential cross section. So D sigma over D omega. So I'm bringing D omega to the other side of the equation. I need to keep this one over four pi here together with 16 pi in the front. 16 pi times four pi is eight pi squared. That's why I have eight pi inside this parentheses. MV squared is part of the amplitude. So that's downstairs inside the square. E squared is part of the amplitude. That's also E squared over here. And then you have the cosecant to the fourth power theta over two. Well, if you like, you can write this one over sine to the fourth theta over two. And that's the expression you, I hope, have seen in the Rutherford scattering. So this final expression exactly agrees with Rutherford scattering. So that's how you recover the non-relativistic limit of the quantum mechanics out from relativistic quantum field theory. So this is actually an important test, right? So we started with quantum mechanics in 137, and we generalized this to deal with the multi-particle system in quantum field theory, first non-relativistic, and then further generalize this to, to relativistic quantum field theory using Dirac theory. 
And when you actually backtrack everything, then this relativistic quantum field theory is supposed to contain everything you have done in non-relativistic quantum mechanics in it. And this is the evidence of that. We now build up relativistic quantum field theory, but if you take non-relativistic limit out of the relativistic quantum field theory, it recovers what you have done in 137, namely in this case, the formula for the Rutherford scattering. So entire 137 is now supposed to be a part of the relativistic quantum field theory. So that's the idea of quantum field theory. So you are seeing really the evidence of that important point, namely the relativistic quantum field theory includes all of the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And just in case you're wondering, I forgot to put in this factor of epsilon naught in electromagnetism. Again, in the natural unit, epsilon naught is taken to be one. Mu naught is also taken to be one. So that's why I didn't bother writing it. As a result, fine structure constant alpha in natural unit is e squared over four pi with no factor of h bar c or epsilon naught. So it may be confusing to you at the beginning, but once you get used to it, the natural unit is far easier because your expressions don't get cluttered with a bunch of factors of h bar c and epsilon naught in the end. So this is an expression I can do in a natural unit. So uh, this I said already, the same thing as Rutherford scattering. So classical electromagnetic force from the Coulomb interaction is now really understood as an exchange of the virtual photon because that picture precisely reproduces what you computed for the classical Coulomb potential uh, in the Rutherford scattering experiments. Okay, let me pause here again to see if there are any questions on this. Okay, so this is, I have to emphasize the lowest order perturbation theory. And if you go to high orders, I mentioned already, I think in response to Natalie's question that the relative charge, sign of the charges actually matter, whether two scattering process is attractive or repulsive starts to matter when you go to the next order perturbation theory computing the box diagram and another exchange of a virtual photon. In the end, you have to compute the exchange of multiple virtual photons and you sum them up in what is called a ladder diagram because they end up looking like a ladder. And the end sum of these ladder diagrams actually knows whether they are in attractive or repulsive channels and that changes the results. In particular, that can lead to the bound states like the hydrogen atom. But that's something you don't see at the lowest order perturbation theory. That's why at the lowest order perturbation theory, Rutherford scattering doesn't care whether the charges are positive or negative, and there's no difference between repulsive and attractive. But that's only because you're looking at the lowest order in perturbation theory. Okay. All right. So now I'd like to talk about just yet another example of Feynman diagrams. And this is something I mentioned earlier already that you can send in particle and antiparticle, let them do a head-on collision. They annihilate into a virtual photon and two particles materialize with different masses now, in this case, mu one and anti-mu one. And again, once you draw this Feynman diagram, you can immediately write this Feynman amplitude by putting in positive energy solution for the initial state the electron. And again, following the arrows, you have the Feynman vertex minus I gamma mu. Further following the arrows, it looks like you are going back in time, but that's okay because it's antimatter. Now you use the negative energy solution for the antimatter for V bar. So this is the electron side of the Feynman diagram. And then you have this propagator for the virtual photon. On the muon side, you start the arrow with the anti-muon going backwards in time. Again, this is just a convention, but it's useful to follow these arrows. You start with negative energy solution V. You follow the arrow, come to the vertex, minus I gamma nu. Further following the arrows, you end up with a positive energy solution for the particle muon. So this is the muon side of things. And once again, once you have these solutions to the Dirac equations, all you have to do is stick in these solutions into this Feynman amplitude. You have to work out these kinematics of the process. But when you ignore masses of electron and muon, 
which is already a good approximation with the collider experiments you have seen the picture of on Wednesday, then everything is super relativistic now, masses are all ignored. So momentum and energies are the same in a natural unit because E is CP and C is one. So momentum and energy are the same. So here's a full momentum for the initial state electron. Here's a full momentum for the initial state positron. They're pointing in the opposite direction along the z-axis. And this is the full momentum for the final state muon going into the direction of the polar angle theta. For simplicity, I rotated the azimuthal plane so that this now lies on xz plane. There's no y direction here, so this is zero. And this is the full momentum for the anti-muon in the final state. Again, spatial components are pointing the opposite direction. So some of the two cancels the momentum, spatial components, and the full momentum is just 2e for the energy and no momentum. And this is the meaning of the center of momentum frame in the relativistic collisions. So if you sum the two, then the only remaining component is time component 2e, then q squared, this is the full momentum of the photon squared. It's therefore just 4e squared, and that is the Mandelstam's variable, s. And once you know the kinematics, you know what the e's are, what the p's are, you can ignore m's, and then these expressions are something very simple, so you can work it out because we are ignoring all these masses. Then it turns out that amplitude is very simple. If all of these particles have helicities plus four particles and minus four antiparticles. And this is actually easy to understand. If electron comes in with a positive helicity, spins is pointing in the direction of its motion. If positron comes in with the helicity negative, then spin is pointing backwards along the direction of its motion. So if you look at the collision of electron and positron, there's net spin of one h bar along the z axis. And do the same thing for the final state. Muon comes out with positive helicity. Anti-muon goes out with a negative helicity. Again, along the direction of the muon, the spins add up to unit one along the direction of the muon, not anti-muon. So what you can see is that you start out the spin one along the electron direction, you end up with a spin one along the muon direction. So spin part of the wave function has the maximum overlap. If the scattering angle theta goes to zero, where muon goes along the direction of the initial electron, then spin one along z direction stays spin one along the z direction. That's when indeed the amplitude is the biggest. One plus cosine of zero is two. On the other hand, when the scattering angle theta goes all the way to pi, that's where mu goes backwards from the direction of the initial state electron. Then you start out with spin one along the electron direction. You end up with spin one along the mu one direction, which is opposite from the original electron direction. So along the direction of the electron, initial state has spin one, final state has spin minus one, then spin angular momentum is not conserved, that has to be forbidden. And indeed, cosine of pi is minus one, one minus one is zero, so amplitude vanishes. So in this case, you're talking about this relativist scattering process, but you can see the angular momentum conservation very clearly. And what you're already seeing in the current homework problem is something very similar. In the case of the backward scattering, and in the non relativistic limit, helicity is, is, if the helicity is conserved, then that would lead to a vanishing amplitude. If the spin is conserved, then that will lead to maximum amplitude. So what you're supposed to see is how the spins are being conserved in forward and backward scatterings, and that's something you should be able to observe by computing the amplitude for electron-proton scattering in an order relativistic limit. At the same time, when you're looking at the relativistic limit, when you ignore the mass of the electron, Dirac fermion would split into two bio fermions. So helicity is conserved instead. Spin is not conserved anymore. 
then you see the spins changing as the electron change in direction. So then you start seeing the behavior like this one, that the spin is conserved when scattering angle is zero, but spin is not conserved when the scattering angle goes to the maximum of pi. So you are supposed to observe similar behavior in the electron proton scattering as well. The expression is different. The way they actually become zero is not one plus cosine theta, but more like cosine theta over two. So there is some difference between electron electron uh, positron annihilation and electron proton scattering. But idea is the same. When helicity is conserved and gets scattered backwards, then spin goes the opposite direction. Therefore, it's absolutely forbidden. And that's what you're going to see in the matrix element of this Feynman amplitude for electron proton scattering. You are seeing the same idea for this electron uh, positron annihilation as well. So that's something you can also work out in on your own, if you like, and plug that into the expression for the cross section. And typically, what well, we are interested in spin average cross section, because the electrons in the initial state is on random, 50% positive helicity, 50% negative helicity. So you sum the absolute square root of amplitude and take the average by one half. And same here, or for the, uh, the helicity of the positron, you sum them up and take the average with one half. In combination of plus plus helicities for initial state doesn't contribute to the probability because then the, uh, the, uh, the wild fermion is not the same species, so they don't annihilate. The positive helicity uh, electron and positive helicity uh, positron are not antiparticles to each other, so they don't annihilate. And same is true with the negative negative. So I get two zeros added up here, and so this is a total probability now, and that reproduces the formula given by this four pi alpha square over three s, which is actually a very famous formula. And if you further include the finite mass of the final state muon, then you get a correction given by the beta, namely velocity of the final state muon. In the relativistic limit, beta goes to one, then three minus one is two over two, that's one. So you recover the original expression in white. But when the velocity is rather small, it starts out linearly with a beta. So this is a response to the question by Miguel, I think, on Wednesday. If you send in relativistic particles and produces a non-relativistic particle in the final state, when the initial energy is just a bit above EMC squared of final state particle, then the final state particle comes slowly with a low velocity, then you have to use this formula instead. So the cross section rises linearly with energy only above the threshold of two mc squared to produce these final state particles. Below two mc squared, it's zero. At two mc squared, it starts to rise linearly. And then if you well above the threshold, it starts to rise much more quickly because of the remaining factors over here. And much later, it starts to go down again because of one of our energy squared in the denominator. And this is indeed the data of measuring the cross section where E plus C minus annihilation leads to even more massive particles called tau, whose mass is something like a uh, uh, 4,000 times heavier than the mass of the electron. And only after reaching that energy, you can start producing this new particle. And it rises according to the curve predicted by this Feynman diagram calculation. So this solid line is the theory and the black dot is the experimental data. Solid line is a little bit smeared, as you can see here. It's not a kink over here. And that's because there are high order corrections we have to compute as well by looking at additional emission of the photons, not only producing tau's, but additional photons produced at the same time. That tends to smear the threshold. That's why it's actually a curve instead of a kink. But including these radiative corrections, the theoretical production is in solid line, which beautifully agrees with this experimental data in the black dots. And actually by fitting these data points, they measured the mass of this tau particle with four significant digits. And that's how experiments can be done by comparing the predictions of relativistic QFT to the experimental data. Okay, any questions about this? 
it looked like Adi wanted to ask a question because you turned the video on. No? Okay. Did I answer your question, Miguel? Good. Any further questions? All right. So let me look at the pictures then. So this is the picture you have seen that E plus C e minus annihilation went to two muon pairs. This is a picture where E plus E minus annihilation went to two electron pairs, E minus and E plus. And here's a tau pair. And tau is a particle that has lifetime as short as one picosecond. So pretty much immediately after it's produced, it will decay. But it turns out that at high energies, even picosecond lifetime gets stretched out by the Lorentz time dilation. So you can actually observe where tau particle decays inside this hector. So which is incredible technology, but you can observe the decay length even less than one millimeter where tau particle decayed thanks to the time dilation effects. In this case, one tau particle decayed into electron and two neutrinos. You are seeing one electron hitting electromagnetic calorimeter over here. Another tau particle decayed into three charged pions together with a neutrino. And you see one negative particle uh, pi minus, two positively charged particle pi plus uh, bending in the opposite directions. And they cause shower, electromagnetic shower, as well as a hadronic shower. So that's what you see over here. So you see a production of new particles that didn't e exist in initial state, but because E plus E minus annihilate, disappear from the universe. And there comes a, cre a creation of a new particles called tau plus and tau minus, and they actually decay inside the detector volume, and you're looking at the decay products. And this data can then fit to the formula we just computed on previous slide, so that you can measure the mass of the tau lepton this way. So that's how QFT works in terms of comparing the experimental data and extract physical observables out of that. Okay, so that finishes up my discussions on a few examples of the Feynman diagram calculations. So any questions about the whole thing now? Okay, so the rest is basically just not details, but I'd like to show you a few more additional interesting ideas for QFD. And that's pretty much beyond the scope of what I want to start, uh, discuss in the course. But some of you kept asking questions about the zero point energies. I felt like I should touch on it called the Casimir energy. And this is actually in the lecture notes, you might have seen this in photon.pdf, but let me go through this quickly to give you just an idea so that you can have a, a better reading later on. So zero point energy is something you have seen already in the quantum mechanics class when you have a harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator comes with a zero point energy of half h bar omega. We have seen that also in QFT. Already starting with the Schrodinger field theory, now moving into relativistic ones, Klein-Gordon field, photon field, Dirac field. Again, there's a zero point energy of one half for bosons and negative one half for fermions. So zero point energy seems to be always there because the quantum field is basically a collection of an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. So a very good question to ask is, is there any physical meaning to zero point energy? It turns out, that it's very difficult to measure the absolute value of zero point energy, which may be possible as a vacuum energy coupled to gravity, which may be accelerating the expansion of the universe today as Saul model discovered as dark energy. But coupling quantum physics to gravity is the world of quantum gravity and nobody really knows what the right thing to do yet. So let's leave that aside. It's above my pay grade, I would say. But the change in zero point energy is something I can talk about. And that actually turns out to have a physical effect. And that's the idea of the Casimir energy. So what I mean by this is that you got this infinite number of zero point energies in nothing, in the vacuum where no particles uh, exist in the vacuum state. You still have this collection of zero point energies for every momentum mode of your quantum field theory. You can't measure that. But if you put two conducting plates in the vacuum and think about the zero point energy for the photon, what you learn in classical ENM is that when you have a conducting plate, like just a metal plate, you have a boundary condition that electric field 
parallel to a piece of metal has to vanish because electrons inside the metal move to cancel the electric field. So that gives you boundary conditions at the conductor that electric field along the direction of the plate should vanish. Magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of the metal plate should also vanish because circular electric current can cancel the magnetic field. So these are the boundary conditions imposed on electromagnetic field. Now you think about quantizing vector potential in the presence of these boundary conditions. Then the motor expansion becomes different because these electrical and magnetic fields have to vanish due to motion of electrons. And it turns out though, that if the electric field and magnetic field of photon has too high frequency though, then motion of the electron cannot keep up with it then these boundary conditions no longer apply. So the situation you have then is that when you quantize the vector potential in the presence of these conducting plates, low frequency photons should be subject to these boundary conditions, but high frequency photons like a gamma rays, gamma rays can easily penetrate a metal plate. So metal plates is transparent from the point of the gamma rays. So these boundary conditions do not apply. So you have to quantize your vector potential in the situation that you place these boundary conditions for low frequency photons, but you do not place boundary conditions for high frequency photons and see if that will lead to any change in the vacuum energy of the zero point energies. It turns out that difference of the zero point energy in the vacuum from complete vacuum, U naught, for a distance d of the conducting plates. So difference between the case without conducting plates and the with conducting plates is something you can compute unambiguously. And you find the energy decreases if you decrease the distance between the conducting plates, which means two conducting plates pull each other by the force of the vacuum, by the force of the zero point energies, which you can measure, which the tiny force Dyne, I'm sorry, this is an old school. Dyne is the 10 to minus 5 Newton. So that's 10 micronewton. So this is actually less than a micronewton, it's a very small force, but this is something you can measure with a cantilever experiment. And indeed, zero point energy exerts force to pull these conducting plates towards each other. And that is what is called the Casimir effect. So again, I don't go very slowly here because I just would like to tell you a story. You can go back and read the lecture notes for now. And so I, I go pretty fast, but this is how you're gonna actually compute this. So here I have two conducting plates at positions X equals zero and then X or D along the X axis. So this boundary condition that the, uh, the electric field parallel to the, the conducting plate has to vanish means electric field which has this polarization vector, which is given by the time derivative of the vector potential needs to vanish along the direction of the conducting plate. So that's the boundary condition. On the other hand, Coulomb gauge condition, as we have seen, is the, uh, the wave vector loaded together with the, vector, uh, the polarization vector has to vanish. So this boundary condition that electric field has to vanish on the conducting plates gives you the profile of the solution to the Maxwell's equation between two conducting plates to look like this, or that, and like that. So you have these harmonic modes, sine pi x over d, two pi x over d, three pi x over d. And for each of these modes, you have two polarization states because you can find two solutions to this k dot epsilon vanishing for each of these profiles. One thing which is kind of intuitive though, is that there is actually a solution that looks like this. In this case, the wave function along the x-axis is one, it's constant, which means wave vector is pointing in yz direction parallel to the conducting plate. So then the vector potential along the x direction is orthogonal to the direction of the wave vector along yz direction. So epsilon pointing x direction 
satisfies the Coulomb gauge condition. And epsilon pointing along the x direction is nothing but x component of vector potential. Then the electric field is along the x direction, which is orthogonal to the conducting plate. Therefore, it satisfies the boundary condition too. But there's only one solution to this Coulomb gauge condition, namely the x direction. So you have only one polarization mode where polarization vector is along the x direction, which is indeed vanishing along with the direction of momentum at conducting plate, but doesn't vanish perpendicular to the conducting plate. So you have one polarization state. So when you uh, quantize the vector potential in the presence of these conducting plates, I have one polarization state for the zero momentum along the x direction and two polarization states for all of the non-zero momentum states. So some of the polarization vectors and the, uh, the, uh, the wave vectors is done by sum over this integer n with prime on it, where prime means to be a factor of half when n equals zero, and factor of one when n equals non-zero. So that's the way we are supposed to quantize it. So when you do the mode expansion of the vector potential, this is a box normalization because we are talking about now Lorentz invariant rest frame of the conducting plates. You again expand this in creation narration operators. And this is the sum over the states in the box normalization, the phase space factor, size in x direct, z direction times the momentum vector in z direction, size of space in y direction times momentum in y direction, and sum over these n's on the x direction. So this is the mode expansion now. And with this mode expansion, I go ahead and compute the zero point energy as a function of this distance d. You sum over all these states with half energy for each state. So this is the zero point energy. The question is how does the zero point energy differ from the zero point energy without the conducting plate where the sum over this integer n is replaced by the sum over the continuous momentum along the x direction. And in order to compute the difference between the two, I focus on the common factor, which is in yellow, which is a function of kx. So I define a, a new variable called u, which is a function of this perpendicular momentum ky plus kz squared. And I introduce this function here, and the square root of u plus n squared is dimensionless combination of EP without a factor of two. So I factored D over pi and L out of out of the square root of e, square root P squared plus M squared. And this F of omega is a function that will make the conducting plate transparent for the high frequency, but totally non-transparent and opaque for the low frequency. We don't know exactly what this function is, but it should something like this as a function of u, this new variable, which has a meaning of squared frequency. Using this common function, I can rewrite the energy with the conducting plates and energy without the conducting plates into a single expression. So this is the difference between the sum and the continuous integral. It turns out that there's a very used formula in mathematics called euler maclaurin formula, where this difference between the sum and the integral is given in power series expansion of the derivatives of the integrand. And for this function here, first integral basically picks up this slope at the low momentum, which is very flat. So this is effectively zero, I can ignore it. When you get to the third derivative, I start to pick up this decline. But once you actually take the third derivative, this function, becomes suppressed by one over square root, which is damped for higher u. So the fact that f goes down at high values doesn't matter anymore. Integral converges without this factor of f. So this actually leads to a constant number minus four. And this number B4 is called Bernoulli numbers, which is given by this definition of the Taylor expansion of this uh, analytic function. Never mind what these are, but it's actually just a number negative one third. If you put all these factors together, then you come up with this prediction I showed earlier. 
So this is just a simple algebra, it turns out, independent of how exactly the conducting plate becomes transparent at high frequencies. And that's something people indeed have measured and agreed with experiment, which is actually the effect of the zero point energy of the photon in the vacuum. Okay, I am running out of time. So instead of stopping here, I take questions after I'm finished uh, with all the things I want to tell you. So we finished the course on undergraduate level QFT, I designed the curriculum for, but just to tell you what you should look forward to if you have a chance to take QFT at the graduate level. We talked about magnetic moment, uh, giving you G fact of two in, from Dirac equation. But many of you ask this question, what happens uh, when B, G is different from two? And that appears when you go to higher order perturbation theory, including what is called a loop diagram, where the lines inside a Feynman diagram can form a loop like this. In this case, what is called the vertex correction, because the correction to the vertex of the Feynman diagram. If you compute this diagram, which was first done by Tomonaga and Schwinger, you find a correction at the order alpha, which is a small correction, only at the level one per mil, but nonetheless it's a correction you can measure experimentally. And amazingly, people have gone ahead and computed even higher order Feynman diagrams up to now order five loops. You start seeing these complicated diagrams, but there are people who are skilled to compute these complicated diagrams. One of the guru in the field is Kinoshida at Cornell. And this is his disciple, uh, uh, Makiko Nio, who is carrying the torch now after Kinoshida got retired. And they can do these complicated four loop, five loop diagrams and make a prediction on the G minus two of the electron with 12 significant digits. Experimentalists also measure the, the, uh, this, uh, the magnetic moment with 12 significant digits, and they agree down to the 12th digit. So that's what I meant, how QED is meant to be really QED on the success of the quantum field theory, because they work so well with 12 significant digits. So the fact that QFD is true is really proven experimentally, hence QED. One interesting hot subject these days is that there is a measurement of the muon the magnetic moment, which is also supposed to be a direct particle, should the subject the same kind of computations. It turns out that experimental uh, measurements and the standard model prediction seem to differ at more than four sigma now. Whether this is really due to a uh, new physics effect, like new particles such as supersymmetry, dark photon, axion, or maybe there's some mistake in a calculation of standard model because a calculation partly relies on data which have its own systematics is a big debate right now. But data does seem to be rather stable because the initial experiment done at Brookhaven National Laboratory had been repeated now at the Fermi lab in Illinois and they seem to agree with each other. And for this new experiment, believe it or not, they actually moved the whole experiment from Brookhaven, Long Island in New York to Fermi lab in Illinois by taking this accelerator out put that on a truck, drove through streets, all the way to Fermilab and installed on a Fermilab site and started the experiment anew and they got basically the same answer. So this is the confirmation that experimental data is most likely true. But there's yet another experiment being planned in Japan that uses totally different technique of measuring mu on G minus two. So we are watching if that comes out to be true. And we are also testing if the theory calculation is also true by redoing some of these uh, 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 the service data, which is needed for the calculations. So the verdict is still out, but this hit became a very hot subject because of that reason. There are new effects in the hydrogen atom too. So if you're looking at the hydrogen atom, and we talked about the uh, these uh, energy levels from Dirac equation, where different in the states with the same values of J turn out to be exactly degenerate with each other as a prediction of the Dirac theory. But when uh, William Lamb came back from the World War II, where he served as a physicist to build radars to detect German airplanes, he came back to his laboratory, used his radar, pointed out to the hydrogen atom, and found that his transition 
between 2b one half and 2s one half. According to Dirac theory, they are supposed to have the same energy levels, but he basically discovered that there's actually a slight energy difference between the two and transition corresponds to about one gigahertz. This is what is called the Lamb shift. So Dirac theory is not complete. And that's where the Hans Bede came up with an explanation that is also due to this loop diagram at the high order perturbation theory and Bader estimated it later on, more precise calculation was done by Springer, Tomonaga and Feynman. And this is based on the theory called the renormalization theory. You have to be careful about dealing with various infinities that come out of these calculations, but something that's something we know to, how to do. And then you can make this definite prediction, which again agrees very well with experimental data. Finally, what we call as a fine structure constant, again, due to this high order diagram with the loops, where any charged particles can come inside as a virtual particles, actually end up changing fine structure constant as a function of energy scales. So when you do experiments at different colloidal energies, for example, the value of alpha is actually not a constant. Fine structure constant, the total misnomer is not a constant. Fine structure constant actually runs, we say, as a function of energy scale according to this curve, which you can again compute using this Feynman diagram. And depending on when Q squared is positive or negative, positive Q squared gives you this complicated dependence, negative Q squared gives you this smooth dependence, but nonetheless, you follow these curves more or less. And experimental measurement done at the highest energies at about 100 giga electron volt is this black uh, green circle, which agrees with the periodical prediction. So the fact that phi structure constant runs is another prediction of the quantum field theory once you go to the grad level courses. And indeed that again agrees with data extremely well. So 137 now changes to one part in 129 at these high energies. So we finished the quantum field theory course at the at undergraduate level. We talked about why you wanna study QFT. We studied none of the Schrodinger field theory, why that is equivalent to multi particle quantum mechanics, we put particles on the lattice, talked about phonons, phonons addition condensate, superconductor, super spontaneous symmetry breaking, spin systems. We talked about the quantization of Maxwell field. We talked about time dependent perturbation theory. We talked about emission and absorption of photons and scattering process. We went to relativistic quantum field theory, first spin, spin zero, then spin one. We talked about antimatter. CPT theorem, Snitzer risk theorem, then introduce Feynman diagrams and look at the various examples. And topical material covered midway of this discussion is the idea that neutrino might be superheroes. And this new, new uh, subject, the G minus two, might actually be a signal of new physics beyond the standard model. So that's all you we, all we did during this semester. There's still a lot to be done if you go to the grad level QFT. But nonetheless, I think you now manage to uh, uh, resolve some of the frustration I expressed when I took the quantum mechanics class, now that uh, you have these discrete photon energy from atoms, these, all of these different processes involved. The photon was discussed as a motivation, but we didn't know how to compute this, but now you do. Now using QFT, you can talk about all these different phenomena that have photon in it, and you can talk about particle wave duality, and then you satisfy this additional needs for QFT to come up with a fully quantum statistics built in and fully relativity built in. And all of these things can now be successfully incorporated into the framework of quantum field theory. And this is finally the relativistic QFT. And you can talk about production of new particles, validation of new particles, which happens all the time in quantum field theory. And then these emergent degrees of free number phonon, Cooper pairs, and then finally relativity. So relativistic quantum mechanics does not exist, but Klein Gordon tried and Dirac tried, didn't work out. But QFT does work, in, in that sense, QFT is a must. You are now dealing with the operators which is a function both of X and T, you treat space and time on equal footing and gives predictions now possible in quantum mechanics like spin statistics theorem, predictions of the G factor 
existence of antimatter and so on and so forth. And now you are in a much better position to make a quantitative predictions on the consequence of quantum physics using quantum field theory. So you need all these tools for condensed matter physics, atomic physics, particle physics, nuclear physics, and astrophysics. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. So that's the end of the course this semester. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you will do well with the final exam and have a good uh, summer break. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. It's been a wonderful semester. Thank you so yeah, much. Sorry that I went over for 10 minutes. Thank you. If there are any questions you can ask now, Addy. No, no question. I was saying, yeah, thanks for okay. a great semester. It's okay. probably the You're most welcome. interesting course I've taken. Good, good. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. So. Um, no I actually questions? have one question. Okay, go ahead. Um, can you actually go back to the slide where you showed the um, like running coupling constant graph? I wanted yeah, to copy sure. the DOI link. Um, okay, wait. And I posted the uh, the slides on the B courses, so you can find that anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, so if you in did, in any then case. Don't. I can show it again. Here we go. Oh, thanks. Any other questions? Um, can I ask one that's like, like sort of related to? It's about like the muon G two square okay. G minus two. Stuff. Um, so I've been reading about that, or like when it happened, I like read about it, and um, I like they used the same ex experimental setup as in the first instance of finding um like that's a right result. so the brookhaven experiment and Fermi of experiment basically use yeah. the same ring for circulating yeah. muons around and you watch the muons decay on its way and which direction the electron comes out tells you something about spin orientation of muon and you can measure how that orientation rotates as a function of time so that's how you they measure the muon g minus two but you might complain they might have some common systematic between two experiments because they use the <laughs> same ring. Yeah, that's exactly that. Uh, there's a new plan to do a G minus two experiment, actually not using this kind of big ring, but on a tabletop experiment using atomic physics technique, muons still need to be created by accelerators. So you need big accelerators anyway, but the muon storage is done on this kind of tabletop scale to measure the electron muon G minus two on a totally different way of measuring it. And that certainly will have different systematics. And if they would agree, then experimental data, I would say, will become established. So using a different technique will be essential in order for us to believe in the experimental data. And whether oh, yeah. we're in theoretical calculation is still yet another whole discussion, but that's, that's yet another experiment being done in Japan called the low energy plus or minus uh, experiment called the uh, super KKB. There you can measure some of the support measurements of the cross section you use for the purpose of your calculation. And hopefully that will be done also on a couple year time scale. So that's why this subject is fairly hot these days. Do you have a question right there? Yeah, that's, okay, good. I just about that for a while. Good. Any further questions well, on anything yeah, during the semester? Miguel? Um, I, I had a follow-up question to what Dorothea okay. asked. So you said that the, the new experiment in Japan, like, so we create the muons and mm -hmm. then we use, a, like, they're using like a tabletop experiment to measure right. G minus two. Mm -hmm. uh, like, how exactly do they store the muons? Because muons decay in like 10 to the minus six seconds or something. Right, right, so, right. Yeah, so, so that the, the, the muon are still somewhat relativistic but they can keep circulating uh, in, in small size like this one and, and still keeping the, uh, the lifetime long enough. So microsecond for the purpose of this kind of uh, particle physics, atomic physics exper uh, experiment is a long time. If you remember the lifetime of the 2P state was a nanosecond and microsecond is a long time. You can do plenty of experimental measurements within a microsecond time scale. So you could still be in business of storing new ones and do precise measurements with it. It's kind of mind boggling, but that, that's the way it is. Okay, any further questions? Another chat. Okay, welcome. All right, I think that's it then. So uh, uh, have a good uh, summer break and hopefully you will do well with the final exam. And uh, uh, yeah, bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome.